Among the mountains, lakes, and forests of upstate New York stands some of America's most intriguing architecture. Intricate detail and charming craftsmanship celebrate the rugged, natural beauty of the Adirondack Mountains. These are the great camps of the Adirondacks. in the heart of upstate New York's Adirondack Mountains and veiled by tall fragrant pines clusters of rustic buildings blend discreetly into the woods they're monuments to a bygone era weaving together elegant craftsmanship breathtaking beauty and memories of some of America's wealthiest families they're called the great camps of the Adirondacks. And at the turn of the 20th century, in an era known as the Gilded Age, they drew families like the Rockefellers and Vanderbilts away from their glittering city mansions to commune with nature. Here, bark-covered beams, uncut stone, and intricate twig furniture spoke to a national longing to connect with the American landscape. This was the first American architecture to declare so overtly and specifically, we belong. The story of the great camps began over a hundred years ago in New York City. In 1880, Manhattan was a gritty, burgeoning metropolis. To flee the summer heat, threat of disease, and grime of the city, moneyed New Yorkers would often escape to Newport, Rhode Island's elegant seaside manners. But by 1889, there was talk among the elite of a newly discovered resort paradise 300 miles north of New York City. The clean air and pristine beauty of the Adirondack Mountains was beckoning America's wealthiest families. The Adirondacks are uh, really extraordinary. Um, they have mountains, uh, water, and forests, and it's the combination of those three that make it uh, unusual. William West Durant saw opportunity in the splendor of the Adirondacks. The son of a railroad tycoon, Durant managed the family's 6,000 acres of land in the remote mountains. Educated and well-traveled, Durant came to the Adirondacks with an open mind, an artist's soul, and a businessman's drive. His vision was to draw the economically overprivileged to build their own wilderness estates um, on land he owned, around lakes he possessed, and with craftsmen he could supply, and in the novelty of a wilderness setting. Durant's vision crystallized on the misty shores of Racket Lake. It was here in 1876 that he would implement a novel idea Camping with a twist. Using craftsmen from the Adirondacks, Durant began building an enclave of rustic cabins, a camp where wealthy visitors could commune with nature, but also have the luxurious comforts of home. Durant named his camp Pine Knot after a large knotted pine on the point. Instead of building a single lodge, as was the custom of the day, he took each room of what would be the normal lodge and constructed it as a separate building. At Camp Pine Knot, each cabin served its own distinct purpose. Visitors would dine together in one building, relax in another, and have sleeping quarters in yet another building. Durant found that the rustic fit 
It made us feel that we belonged because the building seemed to have grown right out of the ground. And therefore, if your buildings belong, whatever you do there belongs. The Swiss Chalet in the heart of Pine Knot was the first of its kind, with a log cabin base and frame constructed top floor. While the chalet had been seen for years in Europe, Pine Knot's version was built with unpeeled spruce logs. Delicate birch bark and twigs decorated the railings, gables, and windows. This was the first most intense use of the rustic in American architecture. It's a chalet and a log cabin, you might say, married. Pine Knot's recreation hall with its 18-foot ceiling was the communal space for game playing and relaxing. But it was in his private cabin that Durant was able to fully express his intrigue with the rustic style, both outside and in. What seemed homespun and simple actually took great skill and was something only the wealthy could afford. William West Durant recognized that if he could build it, they would come. I think Durant really wanted to bring people to the Adirondacks. It wasn't to get them inside the buildings. It was to get them to come here so that they could appreciate the beauty. That's what he wanted. He was a visionary, and Pine Knot represents that vision. Just ahead, New York socialites enjoy luxury in the wilderness that only the Vanderbilts could provide. When Great Camps of the Adirondacks continues. Sagamore Lake is a mirror for the bright sky and quiet beauty of the Adirondack Mountains. William West Durant, the visionary of Camp Pine Knot, loved this tranquil refuge in upstate New York. Its pristine beauty inspired him both as a builder and as an artist. In 1895, Durant took what he learned from Camp Pine Knot and began building an even grander camp. He began with a very large rustic chalet overlooking Sagamore Lake. Instead of building it for wealthy clients, Durant intended to keep the camp he named Sagamore for himself. He really wanted to have one of his own. Uh, he wanted to have inv invite his own friends here and have them come hunting and fishing and enjoy the place. But uh, it just simply didn't happen that way. While William Durant had achieved a great reputation as an innovative builder, his personal finances were in shambles. In 1901, Durant was forced to sell Sagamore. The buyer was Alfred G. Vanderbilt, who was hoping to escape his New York City home for a haven in the Adirondacks. Great-grandson of transportation tycoon Commodore Vanderbilt, Alfred was heir to one of the largest fortunes in American history. In lavish Vanderbilt style, Alfred immediately added more guest cottages to his Adirondack retreat. But it wasn't until 1911, when Alfred married Margaret Emerson, that Camp Sagamore truly came to life. She was an outdoor woman. She loved to shoot. She loved to hunt. She was a crack shot. She was a great horseback rider. And she loved stimulating conversation. But getting family and friends to Camp Sagamore was no easy task. Surrounded by lakes, rivers, and mountains, Sagamore was inaccessible by thoroughfare or railway. Even so, Margaret Vanderbilt's guests were willing to make the journey to Camp Sagamore. 13 grueling hours from New York City. 
I can't imagine doing what these people did, leaving at some ungodly hour and going on the train, taking the stagecoach, then getting on a, a steamboat, uh, in some cases walking across the portage, then getting back in a steamboat, all to come here for a weekend. Upon arriving at Sagamore, Margaret's guests were rewarded for their arduous journey. Sagamore is said to have been built on the cutting edge of technology. So you have these amenities, the same things that you did in town. So even though you've come this huge distance, it's only the illusion of roughing it. Guests of the Vanderbilts could relax on the chalet porch, sitting in wooden slatted Adirondack chairs. In the chalet parlor, guests could read under the glow of beeswax burnished beams. They were given private, elegant cabins surrounding Sagamore Lake. Each cabin was decorated in the rustic style and was equipped with indoor plumbing and electricity. Gracious and spirited, it was Margaret who anchored Camp Sagamore. She loved games and expected her guests to participate in the myriad of camp activities. And that's what Sagamore has always been about. It's always been about having fun. And I can hear her now saying to somebody who would want to bring somebody else up, well, I know they're important, but are they fun? <laughs> For Margaret, the fun at Sagamore began outdoors. Fishing, hunting, and canoeing. But city games were also imported into the Adirondack wilderness. And of course, the most uh, startling import from town was the bowling alley that was available um, at, for day or night because, of course, again, it had electricity in it and electric lights. At Sagamore, no luxury was spared. If the weather was disagreeable, Margaret had other indoor games for guests and a place to play them. Architect William Coulter, who would design many of the great camps, was hired to design the Playhouse. Inspired by Durant's Sagamore Chalet, Coulter created a similar rustic lodge. Inside, a massive fireplace warmed the room while Margaret's guests played billiards or ping pong. I can imagine some real nice parties in there. I think that it probably had some uh, wonderful late night activities going on. Um, you can imagine the marvelous fireplace, you know, uh, being ablaze with the fires. But perhaps the most loved building at Sagamore was the dining hall. To accommodate the couple's sweeping guest list, the Vanderbilts expanded Durant's original space. Matching corner fireplaces bookended the long room, and the gracious bay window offered a view of Saranac Lake. It's a room for celebration in a family camp when everyone ate in the same place. Strong Emily Post traditions of etiquette carried on on those formal occasions um, in a rustic setting. Life at Camp Sagamore seamlessly combined the luxuries of the Gilded Age with the glory of the Adirondacks. When Alfred died in 1915, he left Margaret a piece of his heart. It was written in the will that Sagamore shall go to Margaret. She continued to come here for the next 39 years with first her children and then her grandchildren. So there's no doubt that she was very, very fond of this place. Margaret Vanderbilt's Sagamore inspired guests with a lifestyle that embraced the magic of the Adirondacks. The natural beauty of the blue-green hills and sparkling lakes became an anchor for Margaret's soaring spirit. A spirit embodied in the rustic and elegant structures of Camp Sagamore. Still to come, their names may be overshadowed by celebrity guests, but their signatures are etched in stone and carved in wood. The stories of the unsung heroes, the artisans, 
when Great Camps of the Adirondacks returns. To a guest at the turn of the 20th century, Sagamore, the great camp owned by Alfred and Margaret Vanderbilt, was a delightfully effortless experience. For American high society, going camping in the Adirondack Mountains of upstate New York meant transitioning from the city to the heart of a glorious, isolated wilderness. A transition made easy by the luxuries of home. Tucked away from the camp itself was the heartbeat behind Sagamore, the workers' complex. Living year-round in the complex were Sagamore's hidden treasures, the families who kept Camp Sagamore in flawless working order, and who created much of the beauty of the camp. They were as much a part of the, uh, of the camps as the owners were. They gave life and soul to these places. They were the unsung heroes of not just Sagamore, but all of the great camps. Independent and inventive, these craftspeople built and maintained the day-to-day -day working order of the great camps. Some were third-generation French Canadians whose families had settled in the Adirondacks. Others were New Englanders or European immigrants who were recruited to work in the great camps. Living in an island of wilderness, these woodsmen also had a profound knowledge of their Adirondack home. Uh, they were left, left to their own devices, and um, it made for a creative spirit if you wanted to do anything. It made you very inventive to uh, solve the basic daily problems that you had just, to, just in, in order of survival up here. William West Durant, the visionary behind Sagamore was the first to recognize the artistic spirit in these Adirondack craftsmen. It was Durant who brought the larger aesthetic of the rustic and said, now that's artful. Through Durant's vision, these craftsmen helped to create a unique style of American architecture called rustic. The elegant buildings they created at Sagamore were celebrations of their enchanting Adirondack landscape. Birch bark siding was painstakingly nailed to these structures. Masons used native rocks and stones to build intricate fireplaces. And blacksmiths ornamented door locks and hinges with decorative ironwork. But the lasting symbol of their artistry was in their furniture. Bark-covered benches and chairs, delicately inlaid tables and intricately designed dressers were ingeniously created from twigs, roots, and logs. A lot of people come and see these, this interesting decorative work with these twigs and logs, and they, I, I've had people say, well, how do they bend them like that? They don't bend them. They have guys who spent days out in the bush here looking for just the right bend of a log or a branch of a tree that they would then bring in and utilize those to do the decorative work on these, uh, on these structures. While the Vanderbilt stayed only a few weeks, the craftsmen and their families lived at Sagamore year-round. At Sagamore, they were able to earn a good wage, working and living in the land they loved. There's a real soul connection for, for the people that live here in the Adirondacks with the land. I see it very strongly in the expressions of, in these great camps and, and with the people that worked in them, the integrity of those people in their daily lives. They were a very, very unique individual. These unique individuals put their signature on Sagamore as well as other camps. The craftsmen and their families didn't just maintain the working order of the camps. They were the heart and soul behind every great camp in the Adirondacks. Still 
to come. The shady Adirondack woods are thrust into the national spotlight when the President of the United States comes to stay. A camp known as the Summer White House when Great Camps of the Adirondacks continues. Brought to you. In the summer of 1926, a gentle wind blows ripples across Osgood Pond in the Adirondack Mountains of upstate New York. Along its shores, the quiet hush is broken by a scurry of activity. The workers at White Pine Camp, one of the great camps of the Adirondacks, are expecting a visit from the President of the United States. For 10 weeks in 1926, White Pine Camp was the focus of national attention. President Calvin Coolidge arrived with his entourage on July 7, 1926, and stayed into September at the invitation of friends who owned the camp. The cool mountain air was a welcome relief from the oppressive heat of Washington, D.C. And for a president noted for being somewhat introverted, White Pine was the perfect haven from politics and crowds. Built in 1907 for New York businessman Archibald White, the camp sat under a canopy of red and white pines. While rustic, the architecture differed from the log cabin style common in other great camps. Instead, the asymmetrical buildings and soaring roof lines were almost pre-modern. Perhaps the most distinct feature of White Pine Camp was the rough milled siding. Originating here at White Pine, brainstorm siding quickly became popular throughout Adirondacks architecture. The Coolidge's stayed in the owner's cabin. The interior had a light modern feel for the 1920s. And hewn beams added a rustic touch. President Coolidge set up offices in a nearby town. But the man famous for saying, the business of America is business, spent much of his time pursuing leisure at White Pine. An authentic Japanese tea house was a perfect spot for reading and sipping tea, the strongest drink available here during Prohibition. A curved Asian-style bridge linked the tea house to an island, which in turn was reached by a 300-foot boardwalk. It was here that President Coolidge could be found most afternoons fishing pole in hand. President Coolidge was bitten by the fishing bug. I guess he drove the poor cook nuts because he kept bringing all these fish that he had caught into her to be cleaned and cooked and served for dinner. Ironically, his fishing exploits took up as much news coverage as, uh, as the other decisions of state that he made here at camp. When the fishing was poor, or the mountains unleashed a cool summer rain, the president and his family could take refuge in a covered porch. Or down by the lake, they could enjoy a game at the bowling alley. In the heart of the wilderness far north of Washington, D.C., President Coolidge found a haven from global politics. The president uh, rarely conducted official business at White Pine Camp. This was his getaway spot. When he came back to camp, this was for him and Mrs. Coolidge and their son John occasionally to be private, to get away from the press, to get away from the public and, and simply restore themselves. To many, the president's sojourn at White Pine Camp put the remote Adirondacks on the map. For a brief time in 1926, all eyes were focused on the mountains of upstate New York and the rustic camp that served as the capital of the nation. Just ahead, an American heiress builds an escalator to the stars 
and relies on an unschooled builder to design her heavenly camp in the Adirondacks. Camp Top Ridge, the retreat of Marjorie Merriweather Post when Great Camps of the Adirondacks continues. On a peninsula deep in the Adirondack Mountains of upstate New York is a picture postcard view. It was this vista along Upper St. Regis Lake that captured the heart of one of America's premier business minds of the 20th century. Camp Topridge was the sanctuary of Marjorie Merriweather Post, heiress to the Post cereal fortune she forged into the mega corporation General Foods. A woman of enormous vitality, Post poured her zest for life into Topridge in much the same way she approached her business ventures with passion and unbridled enthusiasm. Topridge was a masterpiece, unlike any other great camp in the Adirondacks. Built in 1923, its grand scale and exquisite craftsmanship elevated camp architecture to magnificent new heights. What strikes me as so remarkable about Topridge is that it's really a designer architect's dream as a site. A peninsula itself is a wonderful site because all the buildings can be placed so that they're on the water. That's the ideal aesthetic setting. It was this ideal setting that Post fell in love with. To escape the summer heat of Washington, D.C., Post set out to build a retreat that would rival her big city estate. Initially, she hired a New York City firm to design an elaborate complex. But Post showed the plans to Ben Monsall, the reputable builder of White Pine and other Adirondack camps. He uh, apparently looked at the plans and said, this is nice, but it's really not the Adirondacks. So the story goes that he scrapped the entire set of plans and designed something for her on his own. At Top Ridge, Munsell constructed a series of buildings he felt belonged. The centerpiece of Top Ridge was a breathtaking Grand Lodge, a work of art that Munsell constructed using huge pine logs and locally quarried rock. Inside, a grand entrance ushered guests up a wide staircase with a railing fashioned from a cedar tree. The stone steps led to a gigantic living room with a fireplace large enough to stand in. The soaring 25 foot high by 65 foot long space was without a post or column anywhere. An architectural feat achieved with massive ceiling beams and iron plates. It was a room built to amaze Post's many guests. It's hard to describe how big the room is. You can tell people the dimensions of the room. You can tell them the height of the ceiling. You can tell them how big the fireplaces are. You can tell them how big the windows are. But it doesn't hit you until you walk in the room. While the views from above were always inspiring to Post and her builder, Ben Munsell, it was the lake below that had the most powerful draw. Munsell's vision was to have guests arrive at Top Ridge not by train, carriage, or car, but by boat. The first thing they saw was a building that would quickly become a masterpiece of Adirondack architecture, the boathouse. I see the Top Ridge Boathouse as being the most romantic, picturesque of rustic structures in the Adirondacks. Munsell used whole cedar trees for pillars and beams, but then incorporated the natural bends of roots and limbs for extraordinary detailing. The real treat was the view from the second story balcony. When you stand inside, looking out um, from that second floor of the boathouse, each of those curved, framed windows frames 
essentially a landscape painting of the lake. And so your experience is of almost living in a landscape, a beautifully done landscape painting. Where artistry flourished, technical innovation followed. To provide a seamless journey from the boathouse to the main lodge, Post built an escalator on rails called a funicular. This device shuttled guests up the hill where she would welcome them into the Grand Lodge. Although privately owned today, Top Ridge still sparkles as the gem it was during the 50 years Marjorie Merriweather Post summered here. A great camp whose essence reflects the grand vision of its owner. The exquisite craftsmanship of its builder and the natural beauty of the Adirondacks. Still to come, powdered sugared pines and frozen hills marked the end of an era. Rockefeller's Camp Winandra a retreat that warms the spirit year-round when great camps of the Adirondacks returns. Run. The seasons in the life of a great camp's architect are like the seasons of nature, always changing with the times. In the era of the great camps of the Adirondacks, successful architects shared two qualities, a love for the mountains and a strong vision for building in nature. One who understood both was William Diston. While growing up in the Adirondacks in the early 1900s, Diston was inspired to become an architect. He studied at Columbia for three years, apprenticed in Chicago, and finally returned to the place he loved. I guess his love of these mountains, uh, as tends to draw many people back, drew him back again and, and he began to create his, his art. In 1911, Diston began a career as an Adirondack architect that would endure for decades. He was inspired by his predecessors, William West Durant, the visionary behind Pine Knot and Sagamore, and William Coulter, a premier designer of great camps. In 1930, Diston set out to design the most exciting project of his life, a great camp of his own. We put uh, great passion and love into creating a design for himself. However, uh, he really didn't have the capital to actually build this place. One who did have the capital was a man who, like Diston, had grown up in the Adirondacks and returned in search of his perfect camp. This person was a Rockefeller, William A. Rockefeller, the great nephew of legendary oil tycoon John D. Rockefeller. The story is one day uh, Mr. Rockefeller came into his offices to uh, speak with someone about uh, designing a camp to be built here in the Adirondacks. And he was walking by and looked down and actually saw uh, the design of this building on the drawing boards and said, that's what I want. That's the camp I want. Rockefeller wanted a camp he could use year round, especially during the long Adirondack winter. Nestled on a rocky point overlooking Upper Saranac Lake was Camp Winandra, named after a Native American word meaning Big Rock. Built from 1930 to 1933, the nine-building complex was smaller and more intimate than earlier great camps. By the 1930s, much of the large timber in the Adirondacks had been depleted, so Diston had to have white pine shipped in from Canada an expensive proposition for everyone but a Rockefeller. You had a combination of uh, the passion and the love of the architect to design the perfect place, and then you had unlimited capital to build it. The combination has created a, a gem. 
Diston's eclectic one-story main lodge, with its broad overhangs and deep gables, echoed the style of William West Durant chalets at Sagamore and Pine Knot. But it was the camp's unusual octagon-shaped entrance that marked the building as classic Diston. Inside, the rooms radiated from wings that stretched toward Upper Saranac Lake. The view to nature was brightest in the Great Hall, where windows lined an entire wall. Unlike other great camps whose buildings were often separate and distinct, Distant combined the living and dining rooms into one cozy, multifunctional space. While the massive truss ceiling and stone fireplaces were typical great camp features, there was a high sophistication to Distin's design. At Winundra, Distin's innovations and Rockefeller's enthusiastic support brought great camp architecture to a new level of refinement. I think all of that has come together to create a rustically elegant, property here that somehow captures the spirit. Camp Winandra would remain Rockefeller's sanctuary for over 30 years. But for many other great camp owners in the area, the Great Depression of the 1930s forced them to sell. The season of great camp architecture would also come to an end. Camp Winandra was one of the last camps built in the Adirondacks. Its beauty, even in winter, is a reminder of the visionaries that made camps like these great. Just ahead, a great camp made from more than wood and stone, one made from golden memories. A father and daughter recall camping at Wild Air, when Great Camps of the Adirondacks continues. For it. <laughs> A dense fog drifts across the surface of Upper St. Regis Lake in the Adirondack Mountains of upstate New York. As the mist of an early morning rises, a great camp is uncovered. A camp that has remained with one family for over 120 years. This is Camp Wild Air. Want to take a look at Whale Island, Gina? You haven't been out lately. As morning breaks, 88-year-old Whitelaw Reed and his daughter Gina Reed paddle across this gentle lake to a small island a stone's throw from shore. Oh, it's a perfect morning for paddling. Lake has never been calmer. When I first woke up, I could see the sun just shimmering on the fog, and I could see the head of a, a lone moon just off in the distance. It was so pretty and so peaceful. On this crisp fall morning, time almost seems to stand still for Gina and her father. Through the years, most of the great camps of the Adirondacks have changed hands more than once. Camp Wild Air stands out, having stayed in the same family for five generations. Established in 1882 by Whitelaw Reed Sr., owner and editor of the New York Tribune, Wild Air was built as a retreat for his family. Like all great camps, Wild Air is a series of separate buildings. A log structure called the Living Room, built in 1917, is where generations of reeds have congregated around the fire. The octagon-shaped billiard room has become a navigational landmark on the lake. In 1930, 
William Diston, well known for his work at Rockefeller's Camp Winundra, designed the Playroom, an indoor recreation room. While log buildings compose the camp itself, wild air is made up of much more than stones and logs. It's layered with rich family memories. That's the original cabin there. Mm. Judy, she loves it up here. Mm. Generation after generation of this family has grown up at Wild Air. Whitelaw Reed cannot remember a time when Wild Air wasn't a part of his life. At age five, I remember it's being really big, being able to row a rowboat out to the island and, and back. Uh, later, it became a sign of sort of growing up, if you could swim to the island, and finally swim to the island and swim back. Through both world wars, economic ups and downs, family, births and deaths, Wild Air has been the one constant for the Reeds. Like her father, Gina was introduced to Wild Air as an infant. Growing up here, I think, has to be one of the most special experiences. You have a sense of place and a continuity where you know when you stand on our front dock and you look out across this lake and you know you're looking at the same scene that your grandparents and your great-grandparents looked at. Today, Gina and her father are treated to a rare treasure. He must be fishing. A pair of loons appear not far from shore. They're so beautiful, aren't they? I think that in, in a lot of ways, loons transcend time as well, as, as this place transcends time as far as from one generation to the next, we, the families, enjoy camp. And throughout all of that time, the loons are here too. The natural beauty of the Adirondacks, along with the magic of shared experiences, bonds the reeds to wild air and to each other. For the reeds, wild air has rooted each generation through its quiet beauty, just as all the other Adirondack great camps have touched anyone who has visited. Rustic and elegant monuments to a bygone era, the great camps continue to thrive in much the same way builders Durant, Coulter, and Diston first imagined. Open to the public and used as inns, White Pine and Camp Winundra, now called The Point, lend themselves to a posh 19th century camping experience. Pine Knot is tended by State University of New York at Cortland, which uses this first great camp as an education center. And Sagamore lives on sharing much of its former glory as a retreat center for conferences and educational outreach. With a passion that equals the beauty of the Adirondacks, The great camps triggered a revolution in natural architecture, built in the heart of our shared wilderness. Sensible Chic creates a comfortable lodge-like bedroom. Then stay tuned for an all-new design show, Public Places, Private Spaces. It's all part of Design at 9, Monday night only on HGTV.